Okay, welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about music documentaries. I'm David Lizabram here with my co-host. Andrew Keats. We are joined today by a very special guest, Jim Ruland, who um, has written a new book, which uh, we very much enjoyed. Um, it is called Corporate Rock Sucks, The Rise and Fall of SST Records. And um, he's joining us today to talk about that and the documentary Reality 86. We'll get into that, but Jim, uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Uh, you want to, um, before we get into uh, too much about the documentary and everything else, you want to kind of uh, pitch your very well-written, very excellent, uh, well, well-written, well well-researched book? Oh, sure. So uh, Corporate Rock Sucks is a narrative history of SST records from uh, the very beginning in Sleepy Hermosa Beach to becoming the sound of the underground and uh, then it's uh, although SST is still around still kicking around uh, it's downfall as a indie powerhouse to what it is today yeah the uh the main character is Greg Ginn um uh, I would say um although there are many colorful characters come in and out and probably the main you know band that SST is most known for is Black Flag so for people who don't necessarily recognize the name of the label um, you know, everybody knows the black flag name and logo, uh, and, and Henry Rollins and, and that whole legend, but there's tons of other very excellent and uh, some very well-known, uh, artists also in, in the book who are featured. Um, yeah, I think, uh, Andy and I talk a lot about, uh, a bunch of music books that we like, uh, like meet me in the bathroom, um, or, um, uh, our band could be your life. Um, you know, these books that kind of cover a scene or an era of music rather than just being about one artist or something like that. And this definitely fits into that slot. Did you kind of have any of those in mind or was that something you were thinking of? Oh yeah. Uh, I was definitely thinking about um, our band could be your life uh, because I knew that there was going to be some overlap in terms of the bands covered. Um, I had, I read, our band could be your life way back when it first came out. Um, I think at the, the end of the previous century, not to date myself, but then um, and very recently the book, the audio book came out where a different artist read a different chapter. And I, so I, I listened to that um, prior, you know, when I was doing the research for this book and, uh, and it was really interesting to see how SST is kind of lurking in the background of so many of the stories um, that are in my book and with many of the artists that are, you know, are on the roster. Uh, another book that was a big influence was Joe Carducci's Enter Naomi, which mm. uh, he began as a uh, tribute to Naomi Peterson, who is a house photographer for SST. And um, Joe Carducci also worked at SST and eventually became one of the four owners and is a big part of the uh, SST story for when he was there. Um, so there's all kinds of inside baseball about the record label there. And then, of course, uh, Stevie Chick's biography of Black Flag um, was was also really helpful because he talked to a lot of people um, that are not available today um, and able to, you know, flesh out some things, you know, a very thorough going over of the band's history. So those were those were three of the main books that I that I was thinking about, um, you know, as kind of like the the foundation text for this one. Yeah. So Greg Ginn has a sort of uh, famous uh, uh, rep, rep, reputation as a uh, a difficult personality, I guess. I, th I think there's um, some stuff about that in maybe in the bathroom. Um, when you were getting into writing about this book, did you did you give any thought? To the the idea that the uh, the person most associated with um, with the, the topic you were going to be writing about uh, is not exactly does not exactly have your reputation for being warm and cuddly and and uh, a fun guy to, to be around. Well, it's interesting because um, I would contest that a little bit because I think part of the problem that a lot of the artists who have worked with Greg have today is that he was so supportive. And he was so generous and he was all about um, making something new and that they were all on the same page. And so artists who later felt like they had been um, 
mistreated by the label, like they didn't weren't paid royalties or they weren't getting statements or you know what, whatever their complaints with the label were, felt this level of betrayal because now this person that they regarded as a confidant, a friend, a creative collaborator um, was now suing them or in their opinion, screwing them over or, or, or just not talking to them anymore. So I, I think that's what adds to the, you know, to the, the drama and the conflict is that this feeling that, you know, someone had, had turned or had changed or had, mm -hmm. Um, you know, this, you know, there's a lot of toxic energy at the center of the story. And uh, to address the first part of your question is like, I was very much aware of that. And I did not want to get, you know, sucked into a lot of, he said, she said kind of stuff about, um, you know, rumors and innuendo and things like that. So I just wanted to stick to, you know, the facts of the label. And of course, you know, Greg Ginn started that label, so he's a very big part of that story. Mm -hmm. And it, it it so it started um, in his uh, mail order electric uh, electronics store uh, type type deal. What what does SSC stand for? I know it's a it's an electronic uh, acronym of some kind or initialism, I should say. Not acronym. Solid state transistors, right? <laughs> Transmitters. Transmitter. Yeah. I, I forget the T. Uh, um, because different people have said different things. I'm blanking on it. Um, this is embarrassing. But yeah, it started out as an electronics company that Greg Ginn founded when he was a teenager. And uh, it was a very successful business. He, he was um, modifying and creating equipment and had patents for several of these things. And not only was he, you know, very savvy in the, you know, the technical realm of, you know, amateur radio, you know, he was conversant in the lingo and was able to start up a zine, you know, to rally people around uh, his enthusiasm for, for amateur radio and, uh, you know, created catalogs for his products, um, advertised in other publications, maintained a mail order list, all skills that would really help out immensely when SST shifted from being an electronics company to a record label. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird because reading his very early life story about how he was this precocious person involved in electronics and things like that, and and um, you know, kind of uh, making his own way. I, I mean, the story the story in a very this is going to sound weird, but uh, you know, his his life story sounds very similar to somebody like Steve Jobs, um, who went in a totally different direction. But you know, I think a comparison could kind of be made about these very complex characters. I mean, there's plenty of other people in that world, but I'm just pulling Steve Jobs as the most obvious example. I, I think that's an interesting one because I think it's, um, you know, that you get a feeling with some of these types of people that they would have been successful at, no matter what they had attempted to do. And um, I'm really fascinated by a lot of these, you know, OG punks because you know, I grew, you know, I grew up with punk, you know, the first show I went to was the Ramones, you know, I graduated in 1986. So, you know, I came, you know, after a lot of that stuff. Whereas these guys, there was there was no punk when they were growing up, they they created it, right. So w the things that influenced them and the and the different twists and turns that they took in their lives is, is always really fascinating to me and that, um, and especially, um, Again, because this is not some 15 year old who was addicted to playing his guitar, but a guy who had a business and an economics degree from UCLA, um, you know, when black, when he kicked off black flag and SST. So really interesting story. Yeah. I mean, in, you know, one of his early bands that he ends up signing is, is like the Minutemen. So it's, you know, and that's a, a band that I think is now regarded as, and what well, has been for a while now, one of the greatest bands in the history of American music. Um, so it's it's not just that he had these this like business wherewithal, or and and that he was uh, a talented guitarist and and had a, a way a, a sense of how to build the build a you know a scene and a successful band. 
like just as a record executive, he recognized talent. He recognized something that that um, no one else was doing, and that there was going to be room for it, um, I, which is a hard thing to do. Absolutely, and I think even beyond uh, re that recognition was he enabled it, mm -hmm. uh, gave other artists, you know, provided them with an environment where they could where they could make art, where they could thrive and succeed. But it wasn't easy. I mean, it was extreme, extreme hardship, extreme poverty. Nobody was making any money. You really had to love to do it. And whatever, whatever, um, I mean, nobody likes sleeping on the floor. Nobody likes waking up with, you know, rodents and things like that. No one likes being hungry, but you had to like look past all that to be able you know, as part of a sacrifice for being able to do this. And Obviously, that's something that very few people were uh, were willing and able to do, uh, which made the artists from the early SST uh, era and those you know early tours different because they were able to endure all that. I think it's interesting that you know today we know a lot about you know it's kind of legendary you know Black Flag on the road thanks to Henry Rollins getting the van, which was an enormous success, but the conditions at when they were home at SST was really not that much different. Uh, they were all crammed in little buildings. They didn't have any money. It's not like they were sitting on stockpiles of money or food or, or anything really. So um, it really, it really took a while and required a lot of sacrifice from everyone. And, it, and it's hard to make a sacrifice when you're not, you don't have like a carrot being dangled in front of you. Right. It's easy for us to look back and say, well, these are all monstrous bands. These are all doing incredible, innovative, essential stuff. But, you know, the innovators, it takes a while to get that kind of recognition, right? Yeah, I mean, even, the, you know, the movie, we'll eventually get into this uh, today, the, the movie that um, you selected for us to, to watch and talk about, Reality 86. Uh, you know, I, I'll be the first to admit, I, I don't have the, the best um, grasp of this, this world. Um, but I had sort of assumed that by 1986, they were closer to <laughs> a uh, regular touring rock band lifestyle. And, you know, it, it's Black Flag's a 10 year old band by that point. And they're still living the hard scrabble, crashing on the floor, um, you know, playing concerts where they don't have the permits and it's not clear if the show is going to go like that. You know, you're 10 years in and it's, you know, nearly 1990 at that point. And uh, it's still basically the, the origin story is still playing out. Right. I mean, that uh, that documentary is, you know, is really a window into that time. Um, it's not like they filmed all that stuff during load in and load out and then went to their hotels. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there were, I mean, I'm sure they must have stayed in hotels every once in a while, mm -hmm. but that was not the norm. And it's not like everybody got a room. They would get maybe a room or two rooms for all 15 people to cram in. You know, I, I just can't imagine what that would have been like. I mean, when I was, when I got out of college, um, I went overseas with, uh, you know, to bop around Ireland and I, and I had very little money and few resources, didn't have a credit card. There was no email or anything like that. And I think back on that time and I'm like, what was I thinking? That was, uh, <laughs> I mean, that was pretty dangerous and, and I tend to romanticize it, but I also remember being like really hungry and thinking about, you know, I borrowed my brother's camera and I thought about selling it every single day, you know? So, I mean, there's, it's kind of interesting that um, when we think back on those experiences, there's one or there's one sense we want to romanticize it, but the other, um, you know, it, it wasn't easy. Yeah. I want to ask one more thing about the Greg Ginn as talent scout, as a and guy, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, label executive. So the book details, you know, most of the artists who were involved in SST at one point, and even over a very short time, there's so many big headline names like Sonic Youth, um, Dinosaur Jr., uh, you know, the Minutemen, like you said, the Meat Puppets, uh, 
Keith Morris, who goes on to be in the Circle Jerks. Um, you know, Soundgarden and it goes on and was on. one that that I, yeah, I sure did Soundgarden, <laughs> yeah. right? Soundgarden. I mean, you know, growing up, yeah. you know, I grew up when Soundgarden was like, you know, maybe the, you know, in the conversation for the top five biggest bands in the world. Um, Who's Purdue? Bad Brain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It goes on. There's also a lot that maybe don't, you know, have that name recognition nowadays, not, you know, to disrespect their artistic merit. Um, But what what I maybe didn't get in the book or maybe I missed was um, uh, my thought is that to be a good A&R person or label executive, you spend a lot of time saying no. Um, we're, I mean, do we know of bands or artists that, um, pitch themselves to SST or tried to get on the label and, you know, they, they passed on them effectively, or was it kind of like, if you're even new about SST and you were in music and you were willing to make that commitment, you had enough merit to, to make the cut. Uh, well, there's one big one, uh, Nirvana. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. At the very end. Yes, that's certainly true. <laughs> Um, yeah, when Screaming Trees, who started yeah. out on SST and put out many records uh, on the label before um, before their uh, major label debut, I think on Atlantic, I don't remember, um, during the height of the, uh, um, the sound of the Northwest. Mark Lanigan, and he wrote about this as, in his own book and then talked at length to me about it, you know, advocated on, on Kurt Cobain's behalf for getting nirvana on sst because you know as artists do they were comparing notes and kurt was you know having second thoughts about sub pop you know with the single um the first single that they put out it had a very long introduction and um sub pop wanted to cut it down you know like cut to the chase and this irritated kurt and and mark you know was having a little fun at his friend's expense saying like and we never get any kind of pushback from SST. They do everything, mm-hmm. whatever we want. We just send them the tape and they and they make it. And same with the artwork, anything goes. And Kurt was like, man, that sounds pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so there's always one big miss. There you go. <laughs> but like, I think there's like, to your point, like there's, I mean, one with Black Flag and SST, there's kind of this tendency to, to look at them in like monolithic terms but the band was constantly evolving and so was the label and you know gin had many interests and you know for a time he was he was really interested in you know music that was you know well written but very loud and very fast um then for a period he became interested in instrumental music and and that became something uh, of an obsession Um, then he became more interested in, in, I shouldn't say then, like there's a timeline, but he was interested in improvisational music, you know, just riffing and and seeing, exploring the possibilities of, uh, of approaching the guitar, like, uh, like jazz musicians would. And, and then even much much later, uh, became very interested in, in beats and techno and, using the repetitive riffage on a guitar in a techno format and it's something that he called guitar techno. And he was passionate about all of these phases. Um, and so the label also went through these different phases and it really depended on, on how the label was doing and what he was interested in, in terms of like what kind of music he was putting out. Um, in the mid eighties, before SST had really, you know, gotten huge, it had already put out some, massive albums like in 1984 you know the my war album from black flag zen arcade from uh who's Du and double nickels on the dime from the minutemen um started putting out a lot of uh you know bands that were more rock and roll you know bands that were um influenced by dio and Hawkwind and black sabbath mm-hmm. and a lot of punkers could not weren't down with that they couldn't figure it out they didn't un- they uh they didn't understand St. Vitus or um, Tom, Tom Trockley's dog or DC3 or things like that. So, um, but, but Greg didn't care. I, I don't think he was so much interested in particular sounds. Like he'd listen to an album and say, that's the sound I'm looking for. I think he was really interested in the people and, you know, the approach to art um, and making something new. And uh, when I, when I talked to um, Vitas Monterey of um, 
Trotz the Ice Pick and The Last, who produced a lot of albums for SST. You know, we talked about bands that were maybe not as polished as you would like when you're making a record, but Greg didn't care. It's like, put out the record. And if they want to, if they get better and want to make another one that sounds better or a different sound, then we'll put that one out too. You know, it's just like he was all about, you know, supporting what the artists were doing in that particular, you know, moment in time. So, but I, I think it was on a, a you know, Dependent on the era, dependent on the time, and it depended on the band, you know? So before we, we get into this movie, um, there's a, a, an anecdote in your, in your book that we got to ask you about. David and I are both uh, huge Grateful Dead fans. Okay. And um, so uh, we, we, we were sending each other screenshots of the pages <laughs> that <laughs> when, when, we, when we got to the section that Greg Ginn attends a, uh, a dead show in 82. And, uh, and is sort of um, dismayed to hear people suggest that, uh, that the you know, Grateful Dead fans wouldn't like Black, Fe Black, uh, Black Flag. Um, so how'd you, how'd you come across that anecdote? And what else, what else can you give us on Greg, Greg Ginn, the deadhead? Well, I mean, it's, it's, um, it wasn't that big of a secret, you know? Um, and I think it kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, Greg Ginn, the musician and the entrepreneur, you know, he was many things. He wasn't just, you know, you know, into one type of music or one style of music, but um, he was really into the, into the Grateful Dead and would wear occasionally wear Grateful Dead t-shirts on stage and, um, and has seen the dead many, many times. And I think um, he, he wrote a letter to the editor of, um, of BAM, Bay Area Music, I think it is, uh, when one of the writers suggested that, um, you know, said something negative about um, Black Flag fans and, and Grateful Dead, and he responded, is like, um, no, actually, the Grateful Dead is my favorite band. And, uh, and he, he went on to say that it was his dream to open up for Grateful Dead. And if you look at the way that especially like in this documentary, Reality 86, which gives an inside view of that last final Black Flag tour, um, it's really modeled after the way Grateful Dead did their business and that, and that they were a part of rock and roll, but they were also apart from it and that they did their own thing. They organized their own tours. They did their own booking, their own ticketing, provided their own PA system and just had like their own little ecosystem and they didn't care what was popular on top 40, didn't care you know, who were the hit makers, they were gonna do their thing and they were confident that people would wanna come along for the ride. And that was all immensely appealing to, to Greg Ginn. Um, I talked to uh, Linda Kite, uh, who was involved with the record label and was engaged to um, uh, Dee Boone. And she talked about um, attending Grateful Dead shows with Greg and how she bought Henry Rollins the ticket to his first uh, Grateful Dead show. So it wasn't, it was not like uh, a one-off thing. It, it was definitely part of, uh, of the culture. I think when, uh, after 1986 or during 1986, rather, when Greg Ginn founded uh, his band Gone, uh, and some members from the East Coast came out to see, he took them up to the Bay Area to see Grateful Dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're doing all this rehearsing in, in, at SST, and then they're like, all right, let's go. And I'm like, well, where are we going? We're going to see the Grateful Dead. <laughs> it's just such a, we, I looked up the show that I think they attended in San Diego uh, in 1982, and um, uh, maybe I'll like put that on our social media if people want to listen to it, because you can listen to it on archive.org. Um, oh, cool. I, like I would really pay money for photos of like these feral young punks, like grooving to the like gentle light funk of Franklin's tower. <laughs> like, you know, I, the, the, the concept of it um, makes total sense. Um, but the clash of aesthetics uh, seems pretty uh, on its face. Um, seems hard to reconcile, but it's but cool. I mean, but then when you listen to something like the process of weeding out or some of the instrumental stuff on uh, family man, um, it makes a little bit more sense. Right. You know, I mean, he I was, gotta say, I think, you know, the, the Louie Louie in, in the, at, at, in reality 86 that they play at the end there. 
um, they fall into a, a really cool long uh, instrumental jam that that reconciles back to to Louis Louis at the end. That's exactly like a Grateful Dead jam. I was listening to it and I was like, this, this, is, this is Jerry would be so into this. You know, Jerry would have <laughs> loved it. You know, yeah. And that was also something that like Sonic Youth became very adept at, right? Sure, they, would, right yeah. they would do a cover of a of a song that was very influential, but then you know, dig a hole in the middle of it and just go into these long freakouts and mm -hmm. come out at the other end of it back into like the cover song, but they've now they've completely transformed it. And um, I think that kind of stuff was very appealing to Greg in. And I think it always had been in the sense that, you know, what else is Hermosa Beach known for? You know, the Lighthouse Cafe, like the most important place for jazz um, in Southern California, um, where e everyone had played there at one point or another. And, and he had seen jazz greats and improvisational artists. It, it was part of his DNA. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so since we're nominally a podcast about music documentaries, we probably need to <laughs> get into this. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about Reality 86th, uh, which is directed by David Markey. It was filmed um, during a, uh, Black Flag tour in 1986 on like, um, you know, fairly inexpensive Super 8 film. Um, film by David Markey, who was um, in one of the bands on the tour. Um, and it was released in 1991. I'm not sure what kind of release it exactly got. You probably know more about this uh, than Jim, Jim that we do. It's not really that easy to find. Um, there's a link on Vimeo, which also maybe we'll throw up on the social media and, you know, that'll last as long as it lasts. Um, or maybe uh, YouTube. YouTube. Um, YouTube anyway, it's the kind of thing you got to kind of poke around for. It's not available like on Netflix or something like that. That's another kind of Greg Ginn, uh, you know, not necessarily making things available that the fans would want situation in 2022. Yeah. Um, but why don't you kind of frame this one for us, Jim? Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, like, you know, you think of SST, you think of, you know, Greg Ginn, obviously, and people like Henry Rollins call, come immediately to mind, who is, you know, a multidisciplined artist, who is, you know, a, you know, a poet, a spoken word performer, and a writer, and a vocalist, and kind of a weird endurance artist, too. But I think that people like Dave Markey or who also fit the mold um, are, are like some of the unsung heroes of SST because I mean, Dave Markey was, he was a filmmaker. He was part of a, a zine, um, you know, that he was part of the uh, We Got Power zine that documented the LA hardcore scene in the eighties from a very youthful perspective and was a champion of a, a lot of bands. Uh, he made early doc early movies documenting the scene, um, and, but also had like his own vision as a creative artist and a filmmaker, um, and was a drummer in a band painted Willie that I think gets unfairly lumped into category of like SST house band. Uh, you know, people who were associated with the label who also had records come out like you know, like Tom Troctoli and DC3 and October Faction and things like that. Um, you know, uh, Painted Willie was its own, you know, own separate entity. And the things that Dave Markey was doing was, was distinct from SST. He was doing those things anyway. And being signed to SST was kind of like a culmination of those things. It was, you know, a dream for a lot of people to be on on like the coolest indie label on the planet, right? But it was kind of a double, it was not kind of, it was very much a double-edged sword because once his relationship with Greg Ginn soured and it seems to sour for everyone eventually, <laughs> then a lot of the work that he produced, he was not able to share with the world because um, Ginn would not release the rights to the music. Hmm. So, in 1986, Painted Willie goes on tour with Black Flag and Gone, which is uh, a new band that Greg Ginn has just started. And it's the longest tour that they've ever gone on, gone on and ends up becoming the last Black Flag tour before Ginn dissolves the band and um, Rollins and company go on to do different things. So um, it ends up being a, a really important document for 
you know, the end of Black Flag, the beginning of what of what Greg Ginn is going to do next, and an insight into uh, you know the the dynamic of life on the road. And so, um, what was you, you know prior to when you you really um, saturated yourself in this world to to write this book? What was your uh, relationship with this movie? Had had was this the type of thing that sort of um, you know, a copy would, somebody would get their hands on a copy and pass it around. Did, did copies even exist? Did you have to see it at some sort of underground screening? Um, you know, what was the, what was the the world of reality 86 like back in say the nineties? You know, I don't remember when I saw reality 86, but bef- and it was long before um, I was researching the book. Uh, it was really helpful to watch reality 86 and read it in tandem with say something like um, Joe Carducci's Enter Naomi, where you just, this avalanche of all these people associated with the bands and you're not really sure who they are or what they do for the label. Um, And then you can kind of see, watch it in tandem with the movie and be like, oh, okay, here's this person. This is what Mm -hmm. that is. Um, But, you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, I graduated in 1986 at a time when a lot of people were starting to fool around with uh, video cameras, right? These big bulky, you know, things that you would hoist up onto your shoulder with, uh, you know, the large cassettes and everything. And um, I had a friend who had a a camera and two VCRs and would edit, you know, little (laughs) movies by, you know, not by cutting and pasting, but just by editing it with the two VCRs by just by recording. And that really, you know, took forever to do. But like, you know, we I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, DC, and it was not unusual for us to like pile in his van with a video camera and, and a case of beer and just like goof around at the at the Lincoln Memorial and you know, film ourselves, you know, driving around the city, driving through Georgetown and doing stuff like that. And it really watching uh, Reality 86 for the first time reminded me of, you know, those kinds of home movies that you would make with your friends in the, in, in the 80s. It had like the same kind of Reality 86 is obviously has better sound, better video and, um, and is edited better, but only marginally because yeah. it's, still, <laughs> it's still super eight. Right. Yeah. And so it really, uh, you know, that's the year I graduated high school. So it's very easy to see myself in the way that they're dressed and the way that they behave and the way that, you know, they're goofing off for each other and mugging for the camera. I mean, it's, I know people have been saying this about people, you know, for decades, but like, I mean, now we're so used to cameras and videos and that technology being with us and you can whip it out, whip a phone out of your pocket and make a pretty high quality video without much forethought or effort. And um, this kind of goes back to a time when that was still a novelty and still very much, you know, new. And, um, and it was just really fascinating to watch, you know, how do all these creative people respond to having a camera, uh, you know, in their face all the time. Yeah, it really re- gave me kind of a n- nostalgia for that time as well, because, uh, you know, a few years younger than you, but I, I remember, you know, in you know, maybe six years later doing the same thing. And while I was watching the movie, I was thinking like, oh yeah, like me and my friends, you know, would tape ourselves on VCR, uh, you know, VHS and, and, you know, goofing around or, you know, being stupid and would then say like, oh man, somebody, we should put those movies, you know, this together, this would be like a great movie. You know, this would be like slacker or something like that, you know, right, when right. in reality it, w- it would not have, <laughs> thank God that, you know, doesn't exist uh, or is lost to time. Yeah. Um, well, no, yeah, I'm, it's, I'm, so, it's so amateurish and, and charming in that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm much, I'm much younger than you guys I'm about 15 years younger, but even, even 10 years younger later when I was in middle school, we were doing the same thing with, with VHSs and it's very uh, reminiscent of that. And the, the other place that, that, that this sort of sensibility shows up that I think is really present in this movie um, is the sort of humor and like just the, uh, just this side of pranksterism that you find in like skate videos Yes. Um, in yeah, in, and like the the humor is really reminiscent. Specifically, the the part in this movie where they uh, find the guy on the street and they ask him his name and what's in his bag, what's in the bag, and he won't he won't answer what what's in the bag, 
and they they sort of go back and forth with them a handful of times. There, there's like, there's no real joke there. there you know, there's, there's nothing really revelatory about it, but but it, something about it feels so special when you're you have a camera and you're doing it and something actually kind of interesting has happened that it takes on this added significance, like the serendipity of it. Or at least that, that was my memory of it when we used to, to screw around filming things. It was like the most the relatively mundane experience would seem hysterical because you happen to catch it on film. Yeah, that's a, a great observation about the connection to state, state videos because there were, there were always these bits, but they were kind of half-baked and yeah. it mm -hmm. felt like you know, the props were like whatever was at hand and it was just kind of, um, you know, created on the fly, which a lot of, uh, you know, um, reality 86 um, captures. There's also um, a fair amount of drug use and, uh, and not in terms of like, you know, doing, you know, dr there's no drinking, they're not doing lines. And if they were smoking, well, they were smoking, but it's, it's, uh, um, at least some of the people were, not everyone was smoking, um, but that's not on camera, but um, they're obviously under the influence of psychedelics, um, which feels like, I mean, maybe that's something that all, you know, kids at the end of high school and the beginning of college are experimenting with, uh, but uh, it was definitely felt more prevalent in uh, the late 80s and the early 90s, but that could just be my bias. Maybe that's Maybe that's the Grateful Dead influence. I really don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the stuff in that along those lines that really doesn't land today is the uh, like uh, gay panic <laughs> aspect. Um, you know, there's a extended sequence. Henry Rollins is the star. You know, the the lead singer of Black Flag. Certainly, by far the most well known person who appears in this movie. You know, he's the person that like is really a mainstream celebrity. Um, and he's not in the movie that much other than when he's performing with Black Flag because I get the sense from your book and elsewhere that he kind of held himself separate and was just kind of off doing his own thing, not goofing around with the, the folks as much. But there is, you know, probably one of the scenes that he's most prominent in the movie is him doing like and a very exaggerated gay accent and, um, you know, talking about, you know, how guys come to hit the punk shows to see guys with hard bodies and all that kind of stuff. And there's a few other elements um, like that in the movie, asking guys why they're wearing makeup. You know, they're, they kind of runs a spectrum. But, um, you know, that that's the kind of thing that um, probably most uh, young white men, uh, you know, mostly straight men uh, would have done at the time and not and just thought it was like hilarious stuff. And now I think. Um, that's the part, at least for me, that looking back, uh, seems a little, at, at best, cringe-inducing. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was uh, very much of its of its era and does not age well. Um, but, but also just look at the politics of the time and the way how much has changed. Um, just the way the, uh, you know, the there was, you know, very overt discrimination and homophobia Um not just in everyday life, but in politics and in media and in entertainment. And, and the entertainment, the movies of like the eighties were also over-sexualized. So, um, so a very like strange messages um, being sent. And um, I mean, also in 1986, you had AIDS coming. I mean, I, I enlisted in the Navy in 1986 and I was doing active duty from 86 to 88. And um in 86, you did not require an AIDS test to, to join the military, hmm. but I needed, but I needed one for my, my exit physical. So like quite a bit had changed. It was changing in, in that period of time. Um, there are, um, I think for, you know, movies of this sort in the 19, you know, in the 1980s that reality 86 is, uh, is fairly harmless. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to some of the overt homophobia that um that i recall in the scene you know you know when i was in high school yeah there's i mean it, there's a certain gay panic sensibility to it that would be strange to 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 do today but it, it could also, have been much worse <laughs> it could have been much sure. worse. yeah yeah so uh um dave markey had told me that um and i i'm I have to let's see he had had a falling out with uh with henry or i should say Henry had had a falling out with him and that there was something that had happened. I don't know if it was something in the zine, but there was, there was some incident between the two of them 
that Dave Markey was kind of mystified by, but that Henry Rollins was not happy with Dave Markey and was, was really not happy that um, he was there on the tour and, uh, you know, had a camera around all the time. That's so, um, so that's also why you don't see Henry that much. And also maybe why Henry was acting the way he did and that, you know, maybe he was acting in a way that he, that he felt would ensure would not be usable in a film. I, I really don't know. I'm just speculating, but, um, and, and it only went one way and I, and I don't think it was, it was long lived. I, I don't know what their relationship is today, but I can't imagine anyone having a beef with uh, Dave Markey. He's a, you know, yeah, it's interesting. And, and so he he did go on to create more movies. Uh, he recently, well, I guess it's not recent anymore. Still feels recent in my brain, but uh, made uh, worked with Dinosaur Jr. in 2012. Yep. Um, so now one, we talk a lot on the show about um, sort of characters that that jump out, you know, either talking heads or uh, just somebody who, who whose personality really comes through in these movies. Um, this movie isn't, great for that it doesn't really have extended talking head sequences when they do have stuff between songs it, it's pretty much guys doing bits um but what can you tell me about andrew weiss from from gone he he struck me as the guy who who really does stand out and was pretty funny he's a dark long dark hair um character he, he has a, a few funny segments yeah well what's interesting about this particular moment in time is that like in in previous SST Black Flag tours, it would be let's say um, Black Flag and the Minutemen, mm -hmm. or Black Flag and the Meat Puppets, or Black Flag, or maybe not so much the Meat Puppets being a good example because there was plenty of tension there. But but with like the Minutemen and Saint Vitus and things like that, these were all people that knew each other extremely well, had spent a lot of time together, had played a lot of shows together. And, and had, you know, um, some camaraderie. I mean, the Minutemen had traveled with the uh, Black Flag several times. They'd been to Europe with them, um, you know, fairly extensive. Well, with this version of Black Flag, they had a new drummer and a new bass player. And then Greg Ginn had started Gone, and he had, you know, um, Andrew Weiss and Sim Kane, two new players from the East Coast who didn't know anybody. And then you had Painted Willie, who, as I've already explained, uh, were, were based in the Valley in North Hollywood at this particular time. And while they, they knew each other, they were not confidants, you know. Um, so you had uh, the guitar player, Vic, Dave Markey, uh, who was uh, the drummer, and Phil Newman, the bass player, and also um, Dave and Phil were vocalists. And they had, Dave and Phil had been in Sin 34, so they were like I said, they all knew each other, people on the West Coast, but they, they weren't, it wasn't like these were all a bunch of buddies from the South Bay or Hermosa mm -hmm. Beach. So you had all these people that were essentially strangers to each other, even within their own band, because Andrew and Sim Kane did not know Greg Ginn that well. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Martinez uh, as Sel Wavelta did not know Greg that well or anybody else. So it was a little unusual for um, a black flag tour to have so many people that just didn't know each other. And then as we know now, Henry Rollins and Greg Ginn weren't speaking to each other and were, um, you know, basically avoiding each other at all costs. So it must have been a very unusual situation for all of these people, these young mm -hmm. men to be on the road like this and, and probably a little tense and I imagine having someone as charming and easygoing as Dave Markey sticking a camera in your face, asking you silly questions, well, must have broken some of the tension and been a relief. And uh, and so Andrew Rice was one of the people that um, that comes through. What I think is really fascinating, like watching this movie, right? So Andrew and Sim are part of Gone, um, but not for long. After. Greg Ginn breaks up Black Flag to focus on Gone. Uh, he doesn't fire Henry Rollins per se, rather he just breaks up Black Flag, which is kind of the same thing because it's only he, Greg and Henry are the only two original member, not original, but only 
the only people who have recorded on an album rather i think well anthony recorded but you, you know what i'm saying yeah and what does henry do when he starts the henry rollins band he recruits anthony and i'm sorry andrew and sim kane <laughs> so he essentially steals them um you know, for the rollins band now i there's a lot I don't know about the Rollins band. It wasn't part of the SST project. So um, I can't really tell you the nuances of all of that or if even steel is the right word, but it sure feels, uh, it sure feels like it. Yeah. Uh, Ginn was inf infamous for poaching other people's musicians and then Rollins did the exact same thing to him. So pretty, pretty fascinating dynamic to watch this movie and, and know that that's coming. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm gonna go back and watch it again knowing that that's great. Um, well, I'll say, you know, the, the, for whatever people, whatever sort of, uh, SST house band reputation they might've had, uh, the performance of response by painted, painted Willie in this absolutely rips. I mean, it's so it good. So what a great good. band. It is yeah. so damn good. I was blown yeah, right? away by it. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, I'm a huge painted Willie fan. I, yeah. I, I genuinely love, uh, the records. I think uh, I'm not sure if they're the first band that's shown, but um, the the instrumental 405, which which really kind of fits in with what Greg Ginn was doing with Gone, which was an all instrumental band, um, really sets the tone for the film and for the tour. And um, um, I, I love that song. I love that album, Mind Bowling. Yeah, I want to um, ask just a little bit more about Henry Rollins, be uh, mainly because. Um, you know, in our world of, you know, we talk about music documentaries, all genres, and obviously Verallins is a person who shows up so often, you know, Although he's like, I think this might be his rock docs debut. It probably is. Yeah. Oh, well, no, is. no, no. Uh, in, you know, in terms of movies that we've watched. Yeah. In movies that we've watched. No, yeah. but when we, last year, uh, we did a draft of some of our favorite or most notable talking heads in music documentaries. And he definitely showed up there. Yes. Um, <laughs> so um, he, uh, it's it's hard not to look at this with you know in retrospect meaning we know what he became for better or worse he became like i said a huge star you know for, as close to a household name as you can get in this world um you know people that even if they don't know his name they recognize him from you know gap ads and and huge movies and tv shows and mtv and you know these and and music documentaries and all these other places that he shows up now i should say not long ago um we reached out to Henry Rollins to see if he would be a guest on our show and he declined. So he's, you know, he, if he wanted to defend himself or whatever, he could have uh, had that opportunity. But um, it, do you get the sense that people recognize uh, at the time that this person had a certain type of charisma or stage presence or camera friendliness or something that, you know, just only some people are gifted, you know, there's only so many you know, David Bowie's out there that just, you know, as soon as they walk on the scene, you can't help but notice them. Um, or did that kind of evolve over time? Was there tension around that? Did other people feel like they wanted that kind of attention? Um, no, I, th I think that Henry Rollins has, has that, that it, that the camera loves him. He's, um, and I think, you know, more than anything, he's, he's an intense presence, right? Whether he's on a stage or in a camera or, or definitely on the stage, I mean, as a performer, as a, as a vocalist, um, you know, he's pretty magnetic as a performer and he's 1000% passionate about music. There's, there's not a disingenuous bone in his body uh, when it comes to music or probably about most things. I think he's, I think he aspires to live his life um, as, as a genuine person, which is the way, which is the way his life is. Um, he's created it so that he can be, you know, about what he's about what he's about and interested what he's interested in all of the time. So um, I, I think that absolutely that that he has that quality, and other you know, I wanted to. You know, part of the problem with uh, any serious consideration of SS, a black flag or SST is that you don't want to give someone like Henry Rollins too much airtime or make it the focus too much because there were so many other artists 
but it's also hard not to because you know he was part of uh, the band when it you know when it rose to the you know the levels that it did which in today's standards wasn't all that high um but you know they were I mean, they were almost, you know, so they, even though that they weren't selling tons of records, they were, you know, in, you know, post Nirvana terms, they were still celebrities in their own right. And, um, and I think people have always recognized that um, he was, he was friends with other artists, you know, before he was a household name, you know, people that nurtured him, uh, people that mentored him. I mean, Chuck Dukowski was an early mentor in his in his literary efforts. Lydia Lunch, um, uh, you know, Nick Cave, and like a, a lot of people saw that this was someone who was just really hungry and really earnest, and again, very passionate. So, I think so. I mean, I mean, I, I don't really like see how you can. I mean, yes, it's frustrating when. All people know about Black Flag is Henry Rollins, who was the fourth singer, um, the fourth vocalist. <laughs> but you know that's that's okay too. I mean, you know, if punk was for everybody, you, it, everybody would listen to it, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think um, we've kind of uh, d- described around the movie a little bit, but you know, just to kind of as we're getting to the end here. Um, you know, I, I don't think we really describe what it is. I mean, basically what the movie is, this is not a movie that like introduces the cast of characters and then you follow them on a narrative that has a beginning, a middle and an end. It's not intended to be that kind of thing. It's about an hour long. It's just performance clips of these bands on the road um, mixed with these kind of um, goofy bits or man on the street type interviews or them commenting, you know, just about the the circumstances of their, you know, reality or lack thereof. Um so, you know, it's definitely not the kind of thing where if you don't know anything about these bands, you're going to rec- you know, that you're unless you know who Henry Rollins is or somebody, you're not going to be like, well, there's Greg Ginn and there's the guys from Gone and whatever. I mean, it's, you yeah. know, they, they leave it up to you to do that kind of work. So it is kind of like a skate video of the time um, or a surf video or something in that, you know, where it's really meant in a way for the heads, the people that were already into it. Um, I, I'm assuming that makes sense. I'm assuming that's right. Like it wasn't really intended to be something that, um, you know, was going to, you know, bring a much wider audience into the world of these, of these bands. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I think the, uh, the analog of skate video is really apt um, because the, you know, the, the main heroes are, are the performances, right. And then there's these little, uh, you know, bits and travel things around it. Uh, it feels very ad hoc. Obviously there was a lot more footage than what we see in the movie. Um and, and maybe there are storylines or things. Maybe if like a reality TV producer had access to however many hours of tape could could come up with a completely different document, right? But this, I think, is just always intended to be like, you know, the greatest American hardcore band uh, broke up, is no longer here. Here's the last, you know, six months of their tour. But unfortunately, when the band broke up, there was a lot of acrimony um both before and during and afterwards and so that led to some hard feelings and um and a reluctance on Ginn's part to re- to release the music so that the video could get a wide audience mm-hmm. so it doesn't have you know it's it doesn't have a the nostalgia factor comes from people who are maybe of a certain age it's not like watching um decline of western civilization and where you're remembering mm-hmm. not only that music and that time of your life but you're remembering the first time you watched it. Um, it. It was, it never had, it was never circulated to a wide audience. There's still plenty of people who have never seen it and you have to seek it out. And, um, but I think the cool thing about, about this particular thing, and, and I, I may be in the minority, but um, it's a great introduction to Dave Markey, the musician, the performer and the filmmaker, especially if you're on his, uh, um, channel on Vimeo, you can see like the dozens and dozens of other projects that he's been involved in and music videos with um, a lot of it, a lot of SST artists. And in fact, a lot of SST artists who have since broken with SST. We're talking about Sonic Youth and Dinosaur Jr. and the Meat Puppets. And um, I think and he, he did something with Husker Du too. Uh, I think that's, I, I don't know. I don't know. 
So, um, so I think uh, it's, it's a really great uh, introduction to his work. Uh, and also an interesting companion piece to uh, 1991, the year punk broke, which uh, is about Sonic Youth, Nirvana, and Dinosaur Jr., uh, which came out five years later in kind of uh, in a much the same way that Reality 86 is like, here's, here's what Black Flag looked like before it broke up. It's like, here's what Nirvana looked like before they became massive. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, all right. So, well, maybe we'll give them a, this, maybe this will give the, the movie a little more exposure and maybe we'll try <laughs> to reach out to Dave and see if we can get him on um, because it sounds like he's got a lot more uh, to share. Um, Andy, yeah, should we cruise it? Should we cruise into our final question here? Yeah, go for it. I'll just, I just want to say, I, I mentioned this up top. I'll just say last thing. If anybody's listening to this and is likes, uh, likes Grateful Dead or Fish um, and has always had a hard time getting into hardcore, tune into that, that Louie Louie performance at the end. It, it, that is, as we say in, the, in this world, that is a type two jam. They, they leave the structure of that song and they get back to it. And it is awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely rips. Yeah, I'm if you like if you like goose, you would love uh, Black Flag. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm going to go back and and watch it just for that part. Um, you know, um, just to because I'm a huge fan of Louis Louis. It's a, it's it's a it's I really love what Black Flag does to Louis Louis, and uh, if you hear their version, you can kind of almost hear, um, you know, the beginning of Smells Like Teen Spirit. Totally. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. So the, yeah. The, the way Black Flag deconstructed that song and put it back together again is is pretty fascinating. And and also like not just uh sonically but lyrically as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we always kind of wrap up by asking, um, you know, if you're talking to somebody who's not particularly a fan of this, you know, of Black Flag, who just doesn't know that much about them or hardcore or whatever, is just generally speaking a music fan or likes documentaries, would you recommend? this documentary or is it really made more for people who have a pre-existing interest? Um, Jim, what's your take on this? I think it's for the fans. Um, I think it's people who, you know, maybe who are hardcore uh, black flag fans before, or, you know, you know, maybe the, maybe the documentary will be make more sense after you've read corporate rock sucks because you've been introduced to all the players and you know uh, where they came from and where they're going. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I haven't really, I haven't, I'll have to think about that. Maybe I'll, I'll watch it again. Um, I remember like watch, watching it when I was, uh, you know, prior, when I was researching the book and being, you know, confused about who, who are all these long haired white guys, you know, like, <laughs> which, which one is, you know, which one is in, uh, you know, you know, which, cause like Vic and Andrew and Cell all kind of like, and Phil Newman, when they have their hair hanging down in their face, it's kind of like, <laughs> who is this? You know, yes, they all look the same. That's totally true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Andy, what do you think? You know, I, I, I actually think that this could be a fairly, um, a fairly decent introduction. I think because the music performances are fantastic, and you know, it's an hour. It's and it, it's it's kind of it's kind of good hanging out. It's like like I'm not a skateboarder, but if I'm at a at a place that somebody's playing a skate video. Like that's a, that's, that's a great mindless thing for me to, to look at. You know, I don't, I don't need to, to particularly understand the difficulty level of each thing to, to get something out of it. And I think that might be true about this movie as well, that you, even if you're not a fan, I think you could, you could tune in, you could tune out, you could um, sort of passively absorb this and, and, and get, get some sense of what it is that people like about this music. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, if you're not really that familiar with hardcore punk or anything like that, it might sound like, oh, my God, I'm going to put this on and it's just gonna be horrible noise that I'm not going to know anything about, you know, if you just don't come from that world. Um, I think because these bands were so innovative that people from for the last 30 plus years have been ripping them off or <laughs> been inspired by them, the music no longer, um, you know, is intimidating in that way. You know, th these, th you know, these lessons have been learned and absorbed into, you know, much more commercial um music um and uh yeah i don't know maybe put, like put on a grateful dead documentary and then throw this one on as a double feature and like kind of expand your mind man like you know you don't <laughs> why not you know it's music uh you know so um but I, the only other thing i would say is uh you know prepare yourself for some elements that 
are, um, you know, not trying to be the woke police or something, but that are not uh, the way that we would conduct ourselves today. <laughs> you know, it's a portrait of, you know, young men uh, on drugs in the 80s. And so you're just going to get some of that and, uh, you know, just uh, be aware of that. Um, Jim, uh, I know we've uh, promoted your book. I also um, don't want to forget to promote um, your Substack, stack uh, message from the underworld, which I um, eagerly read every week. Um, it's really, really great stuff. Um, you've had a lot of stuff recently about your promotion of the book. Um, but uh, even the stuff that's not about that uh, or directly about SST or whatever is um, just great reading. Uh, any other thing you want to promote where people can find you all that good stuff, you know, plug away. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the, the newsletter comes out every week. And now that I'm kind of, you know, the book has been out for a couple of months. Um, there are some other uh, other SST things that I've been wanting to do, like, uh, I've been documenting my SST collection, and uh, scanning all the inserts and flyers and catalogs and weird ephemera I've collected over the years. So I'm, I'm, I'm slowly putting all of that online. And uh, we'll be doing the, some of that through uh, the newsletter in coming weeks. And also have some cool interviews coming up. Um, but also the next book that I'm working on right now is a novel that's coming out in February from Rare Bird Books called Make It Stop. And I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it's it's a punk novel because it's not, but it's punk adjacent. It's uh, it's about a dysfunctional vigilante group um, and it's set in uh, the, the very near future. So, um, so look for that uh, next year, February of 2023. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. Uh, thanks for listening. Of course, if you want to uh, shout any of this stuff out or, or check out where we're going to share some of the links to that Grateful Dead show and some other stuff and maybe a link to the movie as well. Uh, we're at Rock Docs Pod on Instagram, um, on Instagram, but also Twitter. Where that's, where, that's where all the good stuff happens. And uh, thanks again, Jim, for, uh, for being here. And uh, thanks to everybody for listening to Rock Docs.